pastors at uh, Union uh, Church, the newer church in town. We're going on five years. I started it with my best friend. And um, if you ever get a chance to start a church with your best friend, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's really, it really, it's really beautiful and works. So we're doing that. Um, I've been involved, well, long, long time ago, I was in, uh, involved with youth um, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And uh, as our church has begun to grow, I, uh, and our ministry, our, our youth ministry began to kind of develop. Uh, develop. I, I got called out of uh, retirement, so they dusted me off and brought me back in. It's kind of, um, youth ministry is kind of like the mafia. It was like once, once you thought you were out, they pull you back in. You know, and that's a Godfather reference. If you're familiar with that, um, you, you know, your parents would probably be mad at me for recommending that. But um, you know what? I, I really don't care. So there's that. <laughs> um, so how about uh, final step and me calming myself down is prayer, and then uh, we'll get into it, okay? Dear Jesus, we thank you that you are, you are the, the, the peak of revelation. When we see you, we see the Father, we understand the work of the Spirit, we understand your heart for humanity. And so, uh, Christ, I pray that you would give us grace so that we might see you and, and hear you and know your heart. May, us, may we be able to put our ears close to your chest and, and truly understand your heart in these matters because they are they're difficult matters to discuss. So grace over that we pray. And Lord, for, for all of us who are holding pain, who are perhaps suffering currently, um, re perhaps reeling from events and, and things that have happened um, either in what we've done, what has been done to us, or we're reeling because of what's just being done around us, God, I pray for, that you would meet us here and give us grace in this time. Um, Help us to, to have hope and to see you um, as our living hope. So, so God, um, we pray all those things in Jesus' name, and um, we say amen. Or amen if you agree. Um, so in keeping with the theme of ob objective truth, uh, here's my offering around the idea. History is filled with blood and violence. The world is shockingly beautiful, and it is brutal. Injustice is at every level in society. It places in places you'd expect to find uh, evil. And sadly, they're also found in places that you at least expect to find evil. Uh, every day, unfortunately, some sort of tragedy occurs. Um, we live in a brutal world. We live in the world where uh, bullies win and babies die. The question that I've been tasked with today is to address these very things. If God exists, why do we have evil in the world? Right? If, if God is real, why do we suffer with so much, so much evil? Uh, when I was a, and, 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 and let me say, let me say this before I get into it. I know that you probably come in here today bringing so much heartache and heartbreak in your, in your lives, and, and perhaps you feel really heavy. Um, the heartache that I have in my heart brings me in here um, heavy. I, I always have heaviness in me. And uh, I always have a quote or two to kind of help you understand how I think. And I thought uh, today I'd offer you a quote from a book I read a long time ago when I was a teenager. Um, it's a book called The Green Mile. And again, your parents probably don't want me talking about this one either, but uh, guess what? I don't care. Um, uh, it's about a man on, on death row, and he's going to the electric chair for a crime he didn't uh, commit. That's what The Green Mile is about. And what you, what you will see in this quote in here um, are words from a man who's worn out by the pain of the world. And I think his words kind of 
kind of give um, some beauty and some eloquence to the way I feel, the way a lot of us feel sometimes. He's a black man speaking in the uh, probably the 30s or something, so that's why my um, language will reflect that. <laughs> he says, I'm rightly tired of the pain I hear and feel, boss. I'm tired of being on the road, lonely as a robin in the rain, not ever having to, having nobody to go on and uh, with or tell me where we're coming from or where we're going or, or why. I'm tired of people being ugly to each other. It feels like pieces of glass in my head. I'm tired of all the times I've wanted to help and couldn't. I'm tired of being in the dark. Mostly it's the pain. There's too much. If I could end it, I would, but I can't. Pain hurts. It's so real. And uh, the more you live life, the more you will understand it is. It is. Uh, it's going to happen. So I got that out of my system, I think. Um, if God truly exists, why does he allow evil to come into it? Why doesn't God intervene in our pain? Why doesn't he stop it? He can, right? That's a God we believe in. He can, he, if you've read your Bibles, he stopped a lot of uh, really terrible things from taking place. And then if you also read your Bibles... He has not stopped a lot of terrible things from taking place. So this is the question that we're tackling. If God exists, why evil? Why does God not intervene? It is uh, what uh, theologians have fought over, talked through, uh, dialogued and debated for uh, quite a period of time. It's called the mystery of iniquity. Why evil in the world? The mystery of in iniquity. High recommendation, listen to Lauren Hill's song, The Mystery of Iniquity, if you ever, I think that doesn't have any curse words, but I don't know. Uh, I don't know. It, it might not, because <laughs> I didn't read it before. Uh, so anyway, mystery of iniquity. Three things. So we have flow, and, 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 and I get real quick. Number one, I'm going to ask some questions. Uh, hope, hope, two, we're going to look at some answers, I think some good answers. And then number three, which will be in our, 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 um, our uh, what is it, interview process. We're going to talk to three different people about what this looks like in practicalities. What do you do with this day in, day out? How do you work, work through this as a, as a believer in Christ? Okay, so the questions, the answers, and what to do with it. We'll start with the questions. As I mentioned earlier, bigger brains, much bigger than mine, have attempted to have answers to uh, this question of the mystery of iniquity. Augustine, Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, Edwards, they've all made their attempts to answer this question, which is uh, really helpful to me because in my research and my studies in answering this question, uh, I have found that there's no real clear-cut great answer. And if you, have, if you think you have a clear-cut, great answer, I would love to hear it. I would love to hear you articulate that um, in light of uh, ages and ages of historians and theologians trying to approach that question. And so, therefore, when I tell you I don't have a, a clear-cut answer to you, a perfect answer, I, th I think it's really important as we approach this topic and we're, and we're you know, like kind of grabbing onto this topic of apologetics, the idea of defending your faith, the, defi the, the, the uh, approach of articulating your faith. I think it's really important to admit uh, when you don't have clear-cut answers, when you don't know. Do you know, what's really, you know what's really important and humble? Is to know when to say, I don't know. I don't know. I, have, I don't have a good answer for that. And I'm working through that. And you know what that helps us avoid? It helps us avoid becoming jerks for Jesus. We're not trying to be jerks for Jesus. We are simply trying to, as 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 tells us, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for you a reason for the hope that is in you. 
Love that. That's, that's like the theme for apologetics. But let's not forget to attach the last few bits of the, um, the words around this idea. He says, yet do it with gentleness and respect. I know we live in a, in a culture where you watch your, uh, is it TikToks or uh, YouTube shorts or whatever the case may be, and there's always somebody who has set up a crowd and asking questions, and he, he does it in such a smug, arrogant, nasty way. Well, if you want to keep up with culture, that's how they suggest engagement looks. But Christianity looks so different in fact, this is what Peter says. And Peter is a man who knew Jesus personally, and he says, do it. Yeah, give your defense. Give your answers. Tell people why you believe in what you believe in, but do it with gentleness and respect. So he's saying, test your heart. So in terms of the question, why evil well, most people are going to point to the garden. And last night, in fact, when the teaching was offered to us, last night the garden was offered as the answer for why we have uh, evil. And most people are going to, if you're a Christian, you're not going to necessarily argue with that, and I won't either. But they're going to say it all started with Adam and Eve in the garden. But like I said, most people don't have, uh, uh, they, don't, they don't wrestle with that. The difficult question, and perhaps you've never thought about it before, but I'm going to offer it to you now, is this, um, is how did evil get into the serpent? And is it necessary for, uh, in, in order for, uh, is, is evil necessary in order for good to exist? Okay, so let me state those questions one more time, because that was a little clunky. Um, number one, uh, how did evil get into the serpent? How did evil get into the serpent? And is evil necessary, or... Is evil necessary in order for good to exist? I chopped it again. I chopped it up again. I'm going to say it one more time. Is evil necessary in order for good to exist? Okay? The latter is an idea which does not actually come out of the Bible. It's, uh, it's a doctrine called dualism. It's a teaching called dualism, which states that the universe is under the dominion of two opposing principles, one of which is good and the other evil. Okay? If you're familiar with Star Wars, the galaxy is caught up. Yeah, okay, we have a fan. Uh, if you're familiar with Star Wars, the galaxy is caught up in an epic battle of good and evil. The force is very important. In fact, it cannot exist without good and evil. Hey, ladies. Hey, ladies. You two in the front. Hey, ladies. Hey, girls. Hey, you two in the front. You've been talking the whole time. Could you please not do that? Thank you. I appreciate that. And if you, you guys want to continue talking out there, go for it. God bless you. You don't, I mean, I'm, I'm boring, so it's fine if you, do, if you, if you don't want to listen. Um, it's okay. So anyway, we're back to the force. The force is very important. In fact, in the story of Star Wars, it can't exist. Good and evil can't exist uh, without each other. And the problem, though, is that in, in this idea, one can never ever triumph. And that's why we love Star Wars, is that there's always this battle between um, the good and evil trying to bring, bring balance to the, the force. The, the Bible and Christianity, however, tell us that um, this is not the story. The Bible actually tells us that humanity was created good, and evil came into the equation later by a choice. And again, where? How? Where do you, where's the origin of that? How did evil get into the serpent? Well, to quote my hero, uh, Tim Keller, he says, this is the spot on the map where you don't have topography. In other words, you can't actually pinpoint it. And if you can, tell me. I would love to hear your answer, but I have yet to find a good one for how you find out where do you, where does that happen? How do you put your finger uh, on that, Okay. So in other words, we don't know. So when God doesn't, and here's, and here's the thing, when God doesn't actually make a, 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 make a statement on a subject, we need to be careful that we don't make statements on subjects as well. Do you understand the Bible uh, gives us uh, only a certain uh, amount of information, and then, and then it stops? I, I, some of my favorite books of the Bible is when this, the narrative just stops, and there's no, there's no answers around it. it. And it's not for us to fill in the blanks. <laughs> the Bible's not a, is not a, you know, a, what is it, Mad Libs? Have you ever played Mad Libs? Those are fun, but don't do it with your Bible. 
is dangerous. Mad, mad libs with your Bible is dangerous. Now, uh, think about it. If you try to give an answer where there is none, where the Bible hasn't given, given one, think about some of the answers that have been given. I'm going to give you three that might be terrifying to you, okay? Uh, number one, some people say that evil is an, actually an, an illusion. In other words, it's not real. And therefore, you can't take injustice seriously. Meaning, meaning the pain that you feel, it's not actually real. How many of you would argue that with me if I told you your pain that you're having is not real? The things that you are suffering, it's not real. It's all, it's all a, a part of your imagination. You've, you're just feeling it because culture is so, so strange or whatever. Anyway, that's, that's one option. Number two, here's another scary thought. Evil is unconquerable. In other words, you can't, you, it is real, but you can't do anything about it. You can't, it, will ever, it won't ever be vanquished. Um, in fact, uh, an argument posed by uh, John Stuart Mill, he argued that the existence of evil demonstrate that, that demonstrates that God is either not omnipotent, meaning he's not all-powerful, or he's not good and loving. In other words, God is impotent. He can't do anything. He's just this this pie in the sky kind of grandpa that we we dream about when we get really um, full on turkey or pie or something. But he's unco- it's a, he, the evil is unconquerable. And number three, also terrifying. Here's a, here's a terrifying thought that God actually likes evil sometimes, and that's why He made it. Some people would suggest that that God made it, meaning that God is capricious. It's the best word to say that 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 God is moody and mean like you and I. Because sometimes we get mad. Sometimes we fly off the handle. Sometimes we just say things because we're just ticked. And we do mean things because we're ticked. Well, some people suggest that's how God is. God is, is very, very similar to the, the Greek gods who just, you know, they attacked people and taught lessons when they were personally offended. Or we go back to the Bible, the Bible's answer, which is the fourth answer. The biblical idea is that God made Adam and Eve good, and they had to choose between good and evil. Okay? So, so far we've gone through the questions. Now, I'm going to give you two answers. Again, we have limited time, and, you know, I, want, I really want to get into the, the, the question and answer time. But let me give you two, two uh, answers to these big questions. Number one, answer one that I'll give you, it's a philosophical answer, and it's this. If you can't think of an answer, it doesn't mean that one doesn't exist. Okay? If you can't think of an answer, it doesn't mean that a good answer doesn't exist. And here's, here's my challenge to you all today, is can a good God have a good answer you might not be privy to? Can a good God have a good answer that perhaps you are not privy to? In other words, can you trust the character of God when he doesn't give you all the information? If you have good parents, you might have good parents. Hopefully you all have good parents. But if you have, good, if you have a good parent, you know, what, you know what's great about a good parent? Is when you're a kid, they only give you so much information. When I was a kid, that, and I love my, my, my parents. But, but one, of the, one of the gifts they, they did not have was discernment around um, information. And so my mom used to put all of her, all of her stress, all of her worries, all of her concerns, the turmoil she was having with my father, the, 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 the trauma that she had with her, in her childhood with her own mother. She was talking to me about that. And I tell you what... <laughs> If you wonder why I'm so strange, this could be one of the reasons. Uh, it just shaped me. It shaped me that I had too much information as a kid. But here's what, so here's the, here's the philosophical question. Is, is, is it possible that a good God has a good answer for this question, and he's just not making us privy to that? Is it, are you okay? In other words, would you believe me that there is, there's more freedom in mystery than there is in your guessing. 
There's actually more freedom to, to be had to say, I don't know, but I trust the character of God, and um, I'm not going to spend time speculating on, on things that I don't have uh, real clear answers to. In terms of, that's a, that's a good segue into subjective truth. Our truth is subjective around the things that God doesn't tell us. And so um, perhaps, is that a good answer? Perhaps. But maybe you don't, maybe that's not enough for you. And I don't know if any answer truly is enough for you. And I'm perfectly happy with that. Um, but let me give you the biblical answer because it's my favorite answer. Um, we may not have answers, but I can tell you this. And this is from Keller. He says, I can, I can tell you this. We may not have the answers, but I, 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 don't, I don't know why God doesn't intervene in evil and put, a, put an end to it and stop it. But it can't be that he doesn't love us. Okay? I don't know why God doesn't stop things. And you heard my tears as I read through the Green Mile. I wasn't expecting to cry through the Green Mile today. Um, but you could hear my pain in that because I've lost so much in my life. And, and you know what's good to, good, the good biblical answer for me is, is I might not know why, why my sister died when she was 17 years old. I don't know why my dad died in my 30s. So in my 20s, my sister died. In my 30s, my father died. And then, and then in my early 40s, um, or somewhere around there, mid 40s, uh, my son died. When he, was, uh, when he was 20 years old. And I don't have answers. I don't have answers why those things happened. And then, you know what? People have tried to tell me those answers. But you want to know that my best answer has always been is this biblical one. It can't be that God doesn't love me. That's the one thing that holds me in, in this crazy process. Jesus and his life and his death they say otherwise. The cross is the ultimate example of saying otherwise. And so real quickly, I want to, to share with, with you something out of uh, John chapter 11. Because in John chapter 11, Jesus there learns that his friend Lazarus is dying. And I want you to notice, notice how he approaches the tragedy. I have the scripture up on the screen. It uh, begins, and I'm going to just kind of skip around. But in verse 5, he says, it says, Now Jesus uh, loved Martha and her sister and, and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. I love this trip because did you notice that Jesus doesn't expedite his trip? He doesn't rush to be with Lazarus and his sisters. And, and, and I want that to sit with you for a second because uh, Jesus calls them clearly friends, but he also says that he doesn't rush to their aid. Sometimes the Lord leaves space for us to sit in, in our terror, in our anxiety, in our worry, our concern, our fear. Let's us sit there. And he lets them sit there. Perhaps you have sat in suffering for a period of time and you've wrestled with things and you're saying, Lord, why don't you just come and deliver? This is the exact context and scenario that we're talking about here with Lazarus and his sisters. And the question is why? We don't know why Jesus delays. Why does have you ever felt like, Jesus, you're dragging your feet on this? Jesus, you, you know, you know if, you were, if you could just have been here a little earlier, all this problem would have, um, wouldn't, even, wouldn't even exist? Well, that's exactly what's going on in um, John chapter 11. In fact, I'll fast forward you to verse 21. Through Martha, you hear uh, their heartbreak because Lazarus is now dead. And Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God, God will give it. And I want you to notice what she's saying to Jesus here. She is so sad, and her faith is still strong. Okay? You can have real sadness and strong faith at the same uh, time. That is the one of the, you know, you, if you live Christianity, Christianity out long enough, and you actually you actually uh, live humbly in the world, you'll find out that there are so many paradoxes that you will encounter in life, and this is one of them. 
that you can be terribly sad and terribly strong in your faith at the same time. Because she believes that Jesus can, even now, uh, heal her brother. Um, and what I love about this story, again, does Jesus run off and heal Lazarus? No. No, he doesn't run off and heal Lazarus. He actually has a talk with them. And here's what he says in verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? The Bible here and Jesus here specifically is speaking of a new creation. A new, a day when everything that is broken in the world will be made right. In the resurrection, we see all will be restored. Evil, and here's what I'm longing for, the, the day when evil is completely erased and eradicated out of the world, and every tear will be wiped away, according to the book of Revelation. Uh, Martha, she believes that Lazarus will come back to her in the resurrection, but the problem is she wants Lazarus back right now. And you want to know what? That is how I feel. I know where my son is. Uh, I know I will see my son. I know I'll see my father. I know I'll see my sister. I know I'll see all the people who I've lost and, 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 and anguished over in their death. I know I'll see them in the kingdom when that comes. But you want to know the, the other truth? I want my son right now. I want him right now. But here's one lesson that can be extracted as we understand what Jesus is doing in his interaction with these people, with his friends. And let's not forget that. They're his friends. He's delaying. He's not running off to do the things he wants to do. It doesn't, he doesn't cease being a friend in this, this time. God in his sovereignty is looking to show us that while the gifts he gives us are really good, what we always need to ultimately love the most is the giver of those gifts. And this is the challenge of my life is, will I love Jesus more and the most as I continue to live my life struggling with grief? As I, as I sort through grief, is it the gifts that he gives or is it the giver of those gifts? And this is, in my opinion, the problem with pain. We don't always understand the will of God and his heart for us. His heart for us to know, to trust, and ultimately rest, him, rest in him. We don't always know that, my friends. And here's the thing, and I want to create the space for you to understand this. Sometimes in pain, in suffering, sometimes you're just confused. And that's okay. It is okay for you to just be confused around it. This is, the, this is actually what we're seeing in the story. A bunch of uh, uh, confused friends of Jesus. I'm, a, I'm one of the confused friends of, of Jesus. Uh, in, in fact, I love it. When, when Mary, the other sister, meets Jesus, she says the same thing to him that Martha uh, had said. In verse 32, she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. They're, they both have strong faith. They believe in Jesus' power to, to heal and to, to stop evil, to intervene. And they say, if you were just here, this wouldn't have happened. And I'm, and I'm telling you, I don't know how many times I have an image of my son um, the night that he died. Because he, because he was going, he was, he was, he, wild, uh, he was a wildland firefighter. The, the season was over, and he was going to start going to college. And we thought, this is a miracle. Our son wants to go to college now. Um, and it truly was a miracle. And, um, and, he, um, and he was taking a part-time job at Target because he, because he needed, he needed to make a few bucks. He was living in the, in the trailer in the backyard, and he was going to figure out how to maintain his wildland uh, responsibilities in the, in the, during fire season and then work at Target and go to school. We were so proud of him. And uh, he said, Dad, i got to go get some more red shirts, you know, because you have to wear red shirts at, at Target. And I know some of you have these crazy opinions about Target. Who cares? This is where he worked. That's where he worked. Who, who cares if it's Target? I mean, it's, sometimes y'all are so stupid when you, when you emphasize those things. Just putting out there. Um, he just needed to get some red shirts. Didn't mean he uh, ascribed to the LGBTQ plus uh, trans issue. 
uh, he's just, he just a kid trying to make a few bucks, go to school. And you know what? I run through the scenario so many times, and I, there's all these things I wish I would have said. The night he died, I, I wanted so badly to be there, even go to the place where he died. Thank God my wife stopped me from doing that. Um, you, you'd lose your mind. Lewis, C.S. Lewis said that grief feels like fear. In a grief observer, he says, grief feels like fear. And that's exactly what it feels like, sheer terror. And when you lose a, your child, it's probably the worst terror that you could ever imagine. And, and I was just thinking, I just wish I would have said so many things, but all I did when he left the house was I looked at him in the eyes, and I just thought, I, I, I welled up in my, my mind and my heart is that I love him. That's, that's what I thought. Because I love this kid. And that was the last interaction we ever had. And this is why I believe that John 11 is a good answer for us. Because it tells us that um, sometimes pain happens. Sometimes Jesus is not rushing off. Sometimes Jesus isn't, you know, having the right conversation that we think we should be having at the moment. But here's what I love about verse 35 when it kind of culminates. The story culminates at the place that I'm going to stop it. Not, at the, not, where Jesus, not where Lazarus comes back from the dead. Because that's not my story. Miles is still dead. What does verse 35 say? What does verse 35? Here's how Jesus um, responded. He wept. And I'm telling you what. You want to preach a good apologetic in this world? You want to reach people for Christ? Then set down smugness, set down arrogance, set down pharisaical tendencies, set down this idea that we're better than everybody else because we're not. We're, we're, just, we're just saved sinners. They're, they're, they're unregenerate, un, unredeemed sinners. We're just, we just happen to be saved. We just be, happen to be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's, that's the only difference. The gift has been given. We've received it. That's the only difference. And look how Jesus answers them. He created, he created the world. And what does he do? He, he wept. He wept. And I think, my friends, there's nothing more beautiful and helpful than that. The well-meaning people in my life, God bless them, who gave me books and gave me reasons for why Miles is now in heaven, you know, God bless them, those things weren't helpful. The friends who just cried with me and loved me, loved me with their life and loved me with their tears and didn't try to uh, just give me answers and try and fill it with talk, thank God for that. There is a gift to silence, and maybe we'll talk about that later. But again, my friends, I don't know why uh, God doesn't intervene in all the ways in which we want him to intervene. But I'll tell you what, it can't be that he doesn't love us. It can't be that he doesn't love us. I'll close with a quote from Keller, and then we'll go into a time of, of uh, talking. It says... My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a cry which ripples through the, co ripples through the cosmos. And Keller says, this forsakenness, this loss was between the Father and the Son who had loved each other from all eternity. Think about that, my friends. On the cross, Jesus, this forsakenness, this loss was between the Father and the Son who had loved each other from all eternity. This love was infinitely long absolutely perfect and Jesus was losing it Jesus was being cut out Jesus the maker of the world was being unmade why Jesus was experiencing our judgment day my God my God why have you forsaken me it isn't a rhetorical question and the answer is for you for me for us Jesus was forsaken by God so that we would never have to be the judgment that should have fallen on us uh, fell on Jesus instead and you guys, you want to you wanna know what my answer? It's this. 
The reason I haven't lost my mind in grief is, is that I know that all the questions that I might have and they, that aren't answered, the one that it can't be is that God doesn't love me and that I can trust his character even though um, he has not invited me into the, into the Trinity, which I would like, you know, invite me in and let me have a conversation. I don't even want to be a part. I just want to listen. I just want to hear a few tidbits. So, um, so now, uh, let's bring those, those stools up. And Jason, can you come up? And, and uh, Beth and, and Matt, come up. And uh, so we've talked about these questions. We've talked about these answers. And now, I want, to, I want you guys to hear about how, what, we do, what we do with that. And if you have questions, feel free to ask them. And, um, and, but, but I know that the people up here have thought through some really good answers themselves. And so, so Jason's going to lead us, and he's pretty good at this. So um, I'm, I'm pretty confident in, in my brother here. I'll take that. First of all, thank you for serving us so well by helping us think through some of these things. This is not an easy topic, and I think it's something that, uh, is that, that's reflected by the number of students who are here. And so grateful for each of you being here and your willingness to, to think through this and grateful for the way that Scripture does have answers. Um, I appreciate that you brought out the world is not too opposing, you know, reality is good and evil, right? The light side and the dark side, God versus Satan. Let's see how this thing turns out in the end. But rather, um, while God promises us that he's given us everything that we need to know, for life and godliness in his word. We think about 2 Peter 1, 3, right? That doesn't mean he's given us everything that we want to know. Um, I'm, I'm always encouraged by, and I was thinking about this as you were teaching, in, in Revelation 10, which is a book written to, you, know, you were just saying, wouldn't you love to sit in, on, sit in on heaven and get to ask some questions? The apostle John got to do that. And the book of Revelation is all of the things that he saw in heaven. And right about smack dab in the middle of the book, John says, when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the, thunder, the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. So in a moment where John was taken to heaven to get the answers, there were some things that God said, whoa, 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 hang on. I don't want them to know that yet. And that's really remarkable to think about that God in his providence has not revealed to us everything. And we can trust him with that. And so thank you for serving us so well in, in helping us think this through. And uh, I wanted to give you guys each an opportunity to, to kind of talk a little bit. Matt, if you could take a minute just to kind of introduce yourself and, and kind of share a little bit about you know, your familiarity and experience with this yeah. topic. Yeah. Thank Sounds you. Um, I'm Matt Walsh, um, youth and worship pastor at Prescott Life Church. We've been in Prescott since um, 2020. Um, and I got married in 2018. Um, we ended up in ministry um, through the Lord just opening a door. And um, so we're young, and um, we thought we were going to have an issue getting pregnant, and we didn't. So we got pregnant right away. Um, and so we were married for one year, and then so our anniversary was August, and my wife gave birth to our daughter, Riverlyn, in October. So we're young. We started early, and... Um, the first month with our daughter was really great. Um, she was growing and, and eating, and um, we took her to her one-month checkup, and everything was good. Um, and then that next month was absolute hell. She cried nonstop. Um, we could not get her to drink even the tiniest amount of milk. Um, my wife's parents were, you know, let us sleep a little bit, but when we were sleeping, they were in the living room while she's screaming. And uh, we thought, man, colic is crazy. Um, but it got worse and worse and worse. And, uh, you know, looking back, it's, I can see how God was, like, there with us through the whole thing. Um, so we were living in South Dakota. Um, and it was the day of our daughter's two-month checkup. And we were like, oh, we know something's wrong. But in our mind, uh, we thought maybe just, like, a digestive issue um, and so we were like, we weren't panicked or, or worried. My brother was supposed to come um, from Wyoming and visit us. Um, and so we were like, well, you know, he's coming. Let's just cancel this appointment. Um, but there was a blizzard, so he turned around and went back. So that's like the Lord working in, in the details. So we went, oh, well, let's just go to the appointment. 
And we went and um, when they weighed her and measured her, she was exactly the same as she was at her first month checkup. And that's not how babies work. She should have been way heavier and and grown quite a bit. And so at that point, we were kind of looking at each other like, maybe this is pretty serious. Um, and the doctor came in, and it was a weird moment because um, my life leading up to this moment was pretty uneventful. And the doctor comes in, and she's like just kind of talking to us, and she has the stethoscope, and she's listening, and she gets to the heart, and you can just see her stop. And we knew, oh, no, something's wrong. And... Um, so she's like, she took her thing off, you know, immediately. She said, hey, so there's heart murmur. Um, this could be a few things. Um, don't get panicked yet. So they sent us, we did an x-ray to look at her heart. She thought maybe there was a hole in her heart, which at this point I wish that would have been what it was because that's actually pretty um, simple to fix. But when they did the x-ray, they, they found that her liver and her spleen were super enlarged. And um, so then they took us to the ER. They did blood work. Um, and so we're sitting there, our friends came to sit with us in the ER, um, and we knew something was wrong, we didn't know what, um, and then the doctor came, and when they take you into a separate room and they have you sit down, that usually is not, you know, a minor issue, so we knew when we sat in those chairs that we were about to get some, some pretty intense news, um, and so she said, your daughter has leukemia, um, normal white blood cell is like 4,500 to like, I think it's like 11,000. Um, her white blood cell count was 316,000. And so going back to the Lord working in the details, if w my brother would have come and we would have waited a night, she probably would have died in the middle of the night. That's how serious it was. Um, so my wife and daughter got life flighted from Spearfish, South Dakota, which is on the west side of the state, all the way to Sioux Falls, which is on the east side of the state. Um, so they're gone and I'm alone. I drove back to our house. We had taken the job in Prescott, so when I walked into the house and threw stuff in bags, I kind of had that moment as I was leaving. I turned around, looked at the house, and went, I will never see this place again. It was kind of a weird feeling. Um, we got there, and her blood was super thick because um, her red blood cells were, were tanked and her, her white blood cells were, as, as I said, like way elevated. Um, and so... We couldn't really do anything early on because if they would have done a blood transfusion, it would have sent a blood clot into her brain, would have killed her. So for the first couple, um, for the first couple days, it was pretty, pretty touch and go. They they were finally able to just like, they did like a super super slow like over a, you know over a whole night just a trickle kind of blood transfusion to get her blood to where um, her platelets would get to the point where they could operate and do um, a central line so then they could start administering chemo. Um, so we went through eight months inpatient so that we started in 2019, in December 2019, um, and everything was pretty good. We moved here. We, we went to Phoenix Children's for, for a round, and then we transferred over to um, Banner, and um, what happened in March of 2020, we all know the world went crazy, so then uh, only one of us was allowed in the hospital um, at a time, we went eight months inpatient and then two years total. Um, she is in remission now. Um, you would never know looking at her now. She's got some scars and stuff like that. But just, yeah, that was that was kind of a brief, maybe not as brief as it should have been, overview of the story. So there you go. No, thank you for sharing that with us, brother. And just to hear how, you know, you, you and your wife have walked through difficulty is helpful in thinking about some of the things we're going to talk about. So, brother Anthony, Beth. If you two could take a minute just to share briefly. So, well, guess what? We're married. And, uh, uh, we're married. Part, big part of <laughs> Do you guys family. know each other? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Um, well, if I sh well, you shared the story a bit, so mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, you've had tragedy in your life, um, and then we lost together. We've lost a son, and we have another son who's here, which is so sweet. And he just got married. Um, so Ashley, I don't know if she's here or not. She's not here. Um, anyway, so that's kind of who we are. We're, we've been in ministry a long time. Um, we've been married almost 26 years, and uh, which is crazy. Because <laughs> we still feel not that much older than you guys, which is in our minds. Except for like our bodies are old, right? So <laughs> that's kind of where we're at. That's 
yeah. to introduce that. That's I don't great. Know. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's it's a blessing for us, you know, guys like Matt and I, to have people like you who have walked this journey and know God's word and can speak truth. And I think for all of us, to hear the two of you talk about these things is a blessing to us. So we appreciate you guys being here to do that. You know, when we met ahead of time, we talked about wanting to kind of focus the panel discussion on just this idea of tears and silence. Um, thinking about, you know, you did a great job walking through the problem of evil and, and philosophically and biblically thinking about that. Experientially, when we think about walking through suffering, what is the role of lament? What does that look like? How do we do that well? Yeah, uh, I'll take this because I love, I'm a weirdo, but I love lamentations. Uh, I love lamentations before, um, and thank God I loved it before because it was helpful during and presently. Um, I think, you know, it's important, my friends, to know that lament, tears, uh, grief, it has a place in, in worship. In fact, if you if you uh, are um, familiar with the Psalms, which is like one of the most, you know, it's kind of the greatest hits of of the Bible. Um, the a third of the of uh, the Psalm genre is actually lament, and you'll be you'll be surprised, or maybe you won't be surprised that when you um, when you look at what churches mo primarily sing in their in their gatherings, um, it's like ninety five percent praise and celebration. And trust me. I'm all for praise and celebration. I love, I love victory. You know, just hear me, hear my heart. But what gets often misplaced and, and even erased out of the gathering is this idea of, of lament. Because guess what, guys? Most of you have suffered some sort of trauma. Some of you, some of you have suffered the worst trauma that you'll ever receive in your whole life. And I don't even know what it is. Um, and it's so important to know that in the body of Christ and in, in the gathering, in the liturgy, there needs to be made space for people who are broken and hurting. And you know what? It, it's, I'm going to rant a little bit. Can I rant? I've, I've already ranted. Some, you got the microphone. Okay, I got the, go for but, it. But it's ridiculous when, when Christians are playing the part of the happy, happy, joy, joy, and God bless you. And, you know, it's like you're freaking me out. You're, you're not being honest. You're not being honest. And that's not to be, you know, swing to the other side of the pendulum and be just some Debbie Downer. I'm just saying that there's a time and place for lament. And so um, if you're familiar with the Psalms, they're filled with uh, cries and, and frustrations d d directed right at God and into the throne. Because guess what? God can handle your pain. He can handle your questions. It doesn't freak him out. You're not going to throw something at him that he says, oh, I've never thought of that before. Um, so, so I would encourage you to um, actually spend time um, embracing this idea of lament, being okay with tears. Do you, you know, some, so many of us men were told not to cry, don't cry, but Jesus cried, and Jesus was the ideal human. He was the ultimate man, God man, and so I don't care what Joe Schmoes tells me about my, my tears. I care about what Jesus says, and so if Jesus cried, I'm going to cry. So, so let's allow lament without being weird, you know, without being weird, allow that into this, into the space. And, you know, I make a plea to all worship leaders to please embrace the, the collective pain of a people. The book of Lamentations is so beautiful on that. Highly recommend several books. You can, we can talk about that later. Okay. But that's, those are initial thoughts. That's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's okay to cry. Not only is it okay, it's biblical. Jesus did in more places than one yeah, right. and all over the place in the Psalms. And it's not, in fact, it's overwhelmingly present in the Psalms. So good. Yeah. So good. Uh, what would you say on a practical level, somebody who's struggling with pain, walking through suffering right now, or even maybe has experienced suffering in the past, it's still affecting them in a very real and emotional way today. Someone who came into this session hoping for some hope and some answers. Yeah. <laughs> you want me to answer that? You want to answer that? Okay. I don't want to dominate. Okay. We'll do that then. Yeah. Okay. How about that? Um, yeah. So pain is so present. Um, I just wanted to share 
around that idea of it being um, both spiritual, emotional, and physical um, right at the very beginning, um, just to hopefully to encourage you guys. Um, at the very beginning, I was so stunned. I, I guess the word is stunned. I mean, we're not surprised that hard things happen, but we weren't there's really no readying yourself necessarily, right? right? Yeah, I heard you even talk about that a little bit. And so um, we are going to be, um, in a way, knocked down by um, by startling pain. And sometimes we carry that long term. And um, we're definitely in a season, now we're two and a half years in, of carrying that for two and a half years. And what was very interesting at the very beginning, um, something I love to do other than kind of being outside, which I love to do, um, is read. And what was fascinating to me, kind of in this weird analytical aside, as I was like struggling with grief and crying and all these things endlessly, it felt like um, I couldn't read. I could not um, look at words um, in any written form and digest them it's like my brain broke with grief. And so what was fascinating is, um, and so meaningful to me from the Lord, is that we had this idea, we talked about it several times through all of this, we keep talking about it, is this idea of feeding off of a storehouse because I could not go to my Bible um, and, f- and reread comfort. It was, it was a very odd feeling for me because that's all I've done for my whole memory. Um, and so it was um, so sweet and so good of the Lord when I found that place of famine, when I came into that place of famine, if you guys remember the story in Genesis of Joseph in Egypt, um, if you guys have read any of that, um, he was, uh, Pharaoh was having dreams and he didn't know what they were, and Joseph, by God's grace, was um, interpreting those dreams, and he said, hey, there's going to be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine, store, And what I was amazed by is to come into this season of grief and realize that God in his goodness had stored for me food when I could not eat. So I couldn't hear well, I couldn't read well, you know, these kinds of things. And so I was so um, grateful to come to a place of devastation, um, of famine, and look around and look to the horizon knowing, oh, this is long, right? And realize, oh my gosh, God in his goodness has stored up for me things that come to my mind um, when I can't ingest them externally. I couldn't sing, and I know, I'm sure you guys have experienced this. It's difficult. I love being in church. We needed to be in church. I loved it. It was so good, and I couldn't do it. I was overwhelmed, right? And so it was just so sweet to, in the spirit, know that by God's goodness, he had stored up for me his his nature, right, being able to reflect on his nature and his goodness, and that has carried me personally, yeah. You know, what you said earlier, um, you know, we've, and we've quoted the scripture twice now where every tear is going to be wiped from our eyes. Um, what that means, and, and this always helped me, it's just a little thought that I have, and it's, um, so if you look at the timeline of your existence, right, from when you're conceived to when you die into eternity, this is what we're talking about, right? We're, we're eternal. And so that means that this little window of time, this little blip on the timeline, is the only time that we're going to experience pain. It's the only time. And so what that means to me is, and your generation's big on, like, being authentic, right? Like, done with the fake stuff, but being authentic. This is our, really our opportunity to be authentic. So when we're faced with pain and things that we don't understand and, And God, why? And we take that into our times of worship and go, hey, I don't understand it, but God, I still believe you're worthy of my praise. Now's the time, because when we get to heaven or, you know, when we're thinking about, like, to not be authentic, if there's no pain, then then what's the sacrifice? What's the cost? And so when we're faced with pain, that's the sacrifice and that's the cost and that's the, the getting up off the floor like King David, right? And, and. And washing his face, I guarantee you David did not feel like going to the house of the Lord after that whole thing. And yet he does. And and, and so there's this, just kind of a a thought, if there's anything positive that we can pull out of our pain, it's like, hey, I get an opportunity to take my pain before the Lord and worship him, you know, despite all of it. So, Yeah, what a great encouragement. Anthony, did you want to add something to that? Um, 
Yeah, I love the idea of, you know, for, so for some of these kids, they might be going through difficulty suffering right now. Those are some helpful thoughts. For some of them, suffering might be coming. Uh, we live in a broken world. Our hearts are broken. This world is broken. All the other people that live here are broken. It's very likely that for many of you, you're going to experience suffering. It might be next week. It might be next year. It might be next decade. But I, I love some, you know, something that both of you hit on is there were things that the Lord had taught you ahead of time that then became deeply meaningful in the moment and were the, the storehouses that you were able to feed on during the time of famine, what are some of the things that they can be doing now to be preparing for the reality that we live in a broken world and suffering may be coming? Well, don't, the, body, the, the Bible says, do not uh, uh, neglect the gathering of the brethren. Uh, and can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, it, how good and how pleasant it is when the brethren dwell together in unity. In other words, God wants us to gather, even as, even in our pain, especially in our pain, God wants us to, ga to gather. And I won't, I won't go too deep into this story, but, you know, when my son died, when our son died, um, it was on a Friday, and, and we were wrestling with whether or not to go to church. And I was personally wrestling whether or not I wanted to go to church because uh, who wants to go and be devastated with a group of people? Um, and, and, and who has energy and strength for that? And I certainly... As I was praying through that, I was feeling compelled because I, I felt like I needed communion. At, at my church, we do communion every week. Um, it's, our, it's a conviction of ours. We believe uh, so deeply in the unity and the, in the, in the beauty and the, the reality of the union that happens in uh, communion. And so I wanted to be there. But then I didn't want to put pressure on Beth and Silas to be there. And so I kind of gently put it out there like, I, I, I feel like, the Lord's leading, but I don't want to put that pressure on you guys. And, and it's, but I, you know, that was a that was a talk, and Karen was there. I remember that, and um, and we 